five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Ndiho and joining me on uh, Shaka Extra Time Live is Shaka Sal himself, a.k.a. The Kabale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you today? As I often say, I'm hugely terrific. And uh, a warm welcome to you all, our Facebook uh, followers uh, watching us uh, live uh, from all over the world. Uh, Shaka Extra Time is a place uh, where you get to talk to Shaka, the man. Okay, uh, Shaka, uh, let's uh, maybe start off by uh, uh, talking about uh, what just happened uh, here in uh, the United States. Uh, a lot of people are wondering what the heck is going on with the American government. They, they can't seem to put their acts together. They shut the, down the government for about three days. Your reaction? Shut down the government, and in fact, for those, others, those, for those uh, who probably use... Uh, uh, different phrases, uh, it's just like closing down the business. Um, luckily, of course, um, it was uh, shut down um, after, you know, uh, Friday midnight, which meant, uh, for the most part, you're talking about Saturday, talking about Sunday, when you probably don't need uh, a lot of activities really to be attended to. And then, of course, um, it went through Monday. And, uh, of course, then eventually, uh, you know, the Senate and uh, the House of Representatives mm -hmm. uh, voted uh, to end it until, of course, February 8th. First of all, uh, I think what it means for those who may not know really is that um, it reminds me of um, the one time uh, Second World War uh, British Prime Minister uh, Winston Churchill. When he talks about democracy and he says it is a messy business because democracy, unlike dictatorship, where an individual wakes up and says, you know what, there's going to be a road between A and B and C. Mm. And it happens because the rest of the people do not really have uh, the privilege of doing the thinking or even sharing in the thinking of the individual authority who some might call a dictator. Mm. Uh, so their job basically is simply to implement and execute. But in a democracy, you must negotiate. You must negotiate uh, with someone else or different types of parties. And in this particular business, democracy means, frankly, uh, having a government that has three uh, branches that have equal powers. Mm -hmm. And their job, frankly, is to, check, you know, to basically um, watch each other and uh, bring about what is known as checks and balances. And so what happens is that uh, in the United States of America, uh, when you talk about money, when you talk about uh, the past, the White House, the president of the United States of America, uh, this time, of course, it happens to be Donald Trump, who lives in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, one, one, one of the most um, um, arguably uh, most respected, uh, most important uh, political addresses anywhere on this uh, planet Earth. All he can do is propose a budget. The rest is actually done by Capitol Hill, which is made up of uh, two houses. You have the House of Representatives and you have the Senate. And so what happened is that uh, the money is actually kept by what is known as Capitol Hill. So they are the ones eventually who deliberate uh, debate and uh, argue and um, negotiate and agree on whether or not um, they can actually pass the proposed budget. In this particular case, they pretty much agreed almost on everything except few things coming from uh, the Democrats. And uh, we're talking about uh, part of immigration, really, immigration mm. policy, mm. the dream part that uh, was put in place by former President Barack Obama. What is interesting is that, of course, uh, this time around, uh, the shutdown has only spent three days, if you will. Mm. And that means really two, two days which fell on the weekend. We're talking about Saturday and Sunday. And then Monday. But go back, 2013, and uh, former President Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. We're talking about two weeks. Mm. And frankly, it was a very, very inconvenient time for a lot of people. Uh, how, how do you respond uh, to critics who say that uh, uh, maybe this is uh, perhaps uh, uh, 
the, the best of America, uh, the American government at work. Uh, but then when uh, you compare it, compare and contrast it with uh, some places, especially like where we come from, you and I come from, uh, you can't see a scenario like that happening. Uh, you have the president uh, who controls the past. Uh, you, and it's a similar thing in almost all the other African countries. Parliaments really don't have a say who does what, especially when it comes to opposition. Here you see opposition put their feet on the ground and they say, you know what, you don't do this, we don't give you the money. You see, when you think about um, you know, where you and I come from, really, um, on paper, um, it is ideally, again, the budget or the pass is really supposed to be controlled by the legislature. But in practice, in reality, it is controlled by the man who occupies state house in Tebe. Mm. As a matter of fact, at one time he said, you know what? He basically killed his beast. He killed his beast. Uh, you know, he didn't simply uh, assume power in uh, what you would probably characterize as a traditional way of doing things. No. He showed his way to power with AK-47. And so he actually seized power. And he has tried in, you know, in a way that uh, um, he, on, he probably only knows how he does it. Mm. He has tried to make sure that, uh, look, I killed my beast. And it is up to me to decide who takes the leg mm -hmm. and who takes uh, the head, who takes the arm. Mm. And so that's what it happens. Uh, Shaka, let's uh, cross over to uh, West Africa now. Uh, something remarkable happened uh, yesterday uh, in the West African nation of Liberia. They had a transition of power. Uh, it's been a long time since they've had a smooth uh, transition of power. Uh, what does that say about uh, uh, Liberia and where West Africa is heading? Uh, because when you compare it to some of the countries on the continent, especially mm. in East Africa, you can't talk about transition of power, one government to another. Forget it. Very true. But again, you have to realize that um, Liberia also occupies a special historical type of uh, uh, position, really. This is a country that um, was probably never, um, or at least not considered to have ever been colonized by any European power. This was a country that was carved out of that uh, part of the world uh, and uh, given to freed slaves from America. Uh, they went there, they created a class, and uh, they were in charge for a very, very long time. Until 1908, of course, uh, for the first time, uh, an indigenous Master Sergeant Doe mm. uh, shoots his way to power. He kills the president, and uh, he takes over. And uh, then, of course, uh, um, just before he ends his 10 years, there is a civil war. And then you have Charles Taylor, you have Prince Johnson, and what have you, and Prince Prince Johnson ends up killing him. Liberia, the last time I checked, uh, the last time that they experienced what was experienced yesterday was back in 1944. Can you imagine? Wow. 1944, my brother. Wow. So it's not a particularly good sign for uh, some, you know, some other parts of Africa because uh, you have situations where uh, a country like Uganda, where you came from, um, which has never, in fact, experienced that kind of process. You have never experienced in Uganda a situation, frankly, where uh, you had uh, a peaceful uh, transfer of power from one individual to another, except very briefly, maybe in 1980, mm. when we talk about, um, you know, uh, Muanga handing over power to Dr. Paul Milton Obote, but they were basically pretty much the same people anyway. But, but that was a transitional government. It was uh, uh, just there to, uh, to, to, to prepare for, for the larger picture. It was, yes, it was a transitional government, but of course they held some kind of uh, selection which they called an election. Mm. And you know, of course the rest is history because it triggered a civil war that lasted um, anywhere between five and six years. Mm. And then you enter Yoweri Kagutam Seveni back in 1986. And as far as he's concerned, he killed his best. And he continues, uh, uh, essentially, uh, to preside over that beast. Uh, speaking of uh, President Ayori Museveni, uh, 
a lot of Africans have come out uh, to criticize uh, uh, the remarks that were attributed uh, by uh, uh, to President uh, uh, Donald Trump, the U.S. President Donald Trump. Uh, uh, but uh, so far, so far, uh, the Ugandan president has come out on tape uh, to sort of uh, 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 actually say that uh, he loves uh, Donald Trump uh, because uh, he calls uh, things the way he looks at them. Uh, for example, he referred to those statements that were attributed to the president as uh, saying that uh, he's actually a great man because he speaks what is on his mind. Uh, would you agree with uh, his uh, assessment? Well, this is not the first time that uh, Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni has actually uh, said kind words to the United States President, uh, Donald Trump. I remember initially he talked about, uh, he likes the idea uh, that Trump talks about America first and that um, he is not going to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries, which meant that uh, he saw in Donald Trump uh, a license for him to do whatever he wants to do in the Republic of Uganda. And uh, I'm not uh, surprised that he said this because uh, there are some people who say uh, that the Ugandan president uh, is a very smart, very clever, uh, very, um, uh, you know, very witty, and at times, in fact, uh, figure, uh, figures out a way of taking some kind of uh, um, opportunity. So he becomes a sort of political opportunist. Uh, he wants definitely to be on the right side of Donald Trump because, let's face it, the United States, no matter what you think about it, remains the lone superpower so far. And Uganda has a lot. Uganda has a lot to gain by continuing to be on the side of Donald Trump. Mind you, this is also in addition to, you remember the, uh, the United Nations uh, General Assembly uh, vote mm. about uh, the issue of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the United States, of course, wanting uh, Jerusalem or recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. the nation of Israel. Guess what? Uganda was one of those few African countries that abstained. And yet, Uganda also equally uh, claims to be very close and very sympathetic and empathetic mm. to the issue of Palestinians. As a matter of fact, the Palestinian uh, Liberation Authority happens to be having or enjoying an observer status at the African Union. Mm. But guess what? Uganda was missing in action. It did not support the issue of the Palestinians here. Why didn't it do that? Obviously because you remember there were threats from the United States saying that uh, this is the time we're going to know who is our friend. Those who are going to be with us, fine, because after all we give you aid and what have you. And those who are going to be against us, will figure out a way of dealing with them. So it was politically expedient for them not to, uh, to do that? Politically expedient because that is what a political opportunist does. Okay, let's uh, cross over to, before we cross over to Southern Africa, let's uh, stay in Liberia. Uh, what are challenges uh, await a new president, uh, uh, George Weir? A lot of challenges. First of all, you know that uh, in terms of perception alone, uh, the, uh, the political elite, in Liberia, uh, do not really think that uh, uh, George Weir is ready for political prime time. They don't think that he has what it takes to be president, uh, the way they think. And I think that uh, they really uh, greatly underestimate him. Um, there are a lot of expectations, of course, from very ordinary people, young people, uh, people who come from slums, like uh, the type of slum that uh, George Weir came from. You know that uh, he grew up in a slum uh, in Monrovia. Uh, he was brought up by uh, his grandmother and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, he loved the football, and uh, the football turned up to be uh, the magic wand, you know, for him. Yeah. Um, he has already, by the way, uh, um, appointed some members of the cabinet. Most of the ones that he has appointed so far are people who supported him politically. And in fact, they have come under criticism that they do not have the experience, really, that uh, it takes perhaps to run those uh, dockets. But who knows? I mean, there are no institutions, frankly, where people learn to become presidents, where people learn to be ministers, to be ambassadors, and all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That one, I think, you learn on the job. He has also retained um, a former key ally uh, of uh, the 
president that uh, uh, he replaces, um, um, Ellen Johnson Sarif. The foreign minister, the foreign minister will be someone that used to do the same business for Ellen Johnson Sarif. Mm. The problem I think I see, and a lot of people actually see, is that so far he has not named even a single woman to the cabinet. Well, somebody could argue that his vice president is a woman, so that's... Uh... Yeah, but that's not, uh, that's not enough. Uh, his vice president is uh, obviously a former running mate and what have you. Uh, so when we talk about the cabinet, let's face it, you need to have a Liberian cabinet that looks like Liberia, that reflects essentially the social, cultural, political reality of Liberia. Yeah. And therefore, he has to have women on that cabinet. Uh, let's uh, cross over to uh, Southern Africa. Uh, uh, today, uh, we learned of uh, the passing of one of the legends uh, of uh, uh, jazz uh, music, uh, South African born uh, Hugh Masekela. Uh, you've had an opportunity, you had an opportunity in the past uh, to interact with him uh, to more than one occasion. You interviewed him. Uh, you even visited him at uh, his uh, residence. Uh, maybe uh, t share with us uh, your thoughts. An incredible man, Hugh Masekera. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, uh, he's a man um, that uh, uh, history will look at and say, you know, this is a man whose music really was symbolic uh, of the fight and the struggle against apartheid. There's no question about it. Uh, he was a very nice man, mm. very intelligent. He studied music both um, in London and uh, in New York. Uh, he was uh, the first uh, husband of uh, uh, another legend in terms of music, and who used the music really also for fighting against apartheid, uh, Miriam Makeba. They married back, I think, in 1964, and all kind of stuff. He was very close to another icon called uh, Harry Belafonte. Um, and when you talk about South Africa, he was the father of South African jazz, really. Uh, you know, he was um, a great uh, uh, trumpeter. He played the saxophone. And uh, I one time had uh, the dubious privilege of making a mistake in interviewing him and asking him, when did you first learn how to play the guitar? And he looks at me and he said, Shaka, come on, man, what are you talking about? Yes, I played the guitar, but really my thing is not a guitar. It I is the saxophone. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> the saxophone. Um, he's a guy that we could hang out and talk about mm. all sorts of things. Uh, the last time, in fact, I interviewed him in Johannesburg was in October 2009. It was very, very interesting. In fact, I was looking back at uh, the interview, and I said, you know, I was one of those few lucky dudes that uh, was able to interact with this great man uh, and was able to benefit enormously from his experiences and what have you, because he had a lot of powerful friends, mm -hmm. a lot of admirers. I remember the first time, in fact, I interviewed him, um, I was still operating out of Studio 18, uh, the famous Studio 18 of Straight Talk Africa, where, in fact, Straight Talk Africa was born, and had just finished having an interaction with another great man from West Africa, Fred Lieutenant Jerry Jorings, Jerry Jerry John, John Rawlings, retired but not tired. And who comes? Huma Sekera. And they were very close buddies, apparently, when Jerry John Rawlings was in the Air Force as a pirate. They used to hang out together downtown Accra because uh, Huma Sekera uh, used to work out of there. And in fact, uh, he also, uh, at one time, I think before the last wife, was in fact a Ghanaian even though he married so many different women and kind of stuff. I'm glad that um, I understand he actually has a son called Sal Masekela, mm -hmm. who happens to be an American television host. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, let's uh, go to some uh, comments, Sashaka. Uh, let's start in uh, Tanzania. Sayed Shaka, how true is it that a commoner citizen is part of government in Africa? Sayed, I think uh, that... Uh, in theory, yes. In theory, uh, you always hear politicians, you always hear uh, people who have power talking about uh, how the people are the sovereign, that power belongs to the people. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, when it comes to reality, those people, if you ask them, those individuals who are those people, 
you'll be surprised because they may not even really know who they are talking about. Mm -hmm. Because power can only belong to the people if those people have their power, for example, to make their elected officials or to make their governors accountable to them. But for the most part, there is a saying that uh, politicians, when they are campaigning for office, they do that one in the poetry. They promise heaven on earth. They pro promise to do all sorts of things. But when they are elected and come to the business of governing, that one, it is said, they actually do it in a pros, meaning they look at the political, social, cultural, economic reality and what have you, mm -hmm. and they simply respond or react. They do not really initiate a lot of times. So I think part of the problem is that uh, the people, for the most part, uh, tend not to be socially and politically aware mm -hmm. so that they know who, what their rights are, their constitutional rights, their inalienable right, which in fact I would even characterize or go far as to characterize as birth rights because they are the people in charge. They are the bosses of those people. You hire politicians mm -hmm. for a certain period and that happens to be true especially in the Western world. For example, in this country, we have a president called Donald Trump. When you look at uh, the figures about people who went to vote and what have you, you find that he was actually elected by a very small minority of people uh, who were disgruntled, uh, people who were, uh, felt that they were marginalized and what have you, and they came out in droves mm. and voted for him. And he is the president, obviously, because uh, uh, he is the person that uh, won the Electoral College. Uh, the Electoral College has the magic number of 270, uh, you know, electoral mm -hmm. votes, and he got it. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you look at uh, his opponent, Hillary Rodham Clinton, actually won a plurality of the vote, the majority of the vote, but he probably won that out of California. California cannot go get more than the kind of uh, electoral colleges that it has. Mm. But it is obviously very legal and very legitimate and everybody looks at Trump and at least as the president for the next four years. The good thing is about here, there is a democracy. Mm. There is accountability. And we know that Trump, for example, at least is expected to finish four years before he renews another term if in fact the people are willing to give it to him. Mm. But when you go to Africa, most of the countries there. there is, these people who are leaders do not account to their people. These people are the bosses of the people who are supposed to be their bosses. Mm. So in a lot of times, Said from Tanzania, most people, especially in Africa, frankly, uh, are not really part of the government. You know, when you talk about uh, elective electoral mm. elections, you have these candidates saying you must have a high school diploma or university degree, which means if you don't have, you are disfranchised, basically. Yeah, yeah. Shaka, let's go to other comments here. Uh, we have a comment uh, from uh, Rajaba Hockey. Uh, he says, Shaka, what do you mean uh, when you say that President Yorim Seven is a political opportunist? What I mean is that uh, he sees at what is, what someone will call, what is politically expedient, and he goes for it. Let's face it, uh, President Trump uh, uh, used some kind of, at least from those who say that they were in the room, he used some vulgar language. And you can see how the entire African continent reacted. Mm. Namely, I remember the president of Botswana, uh, you know, Teresa Kama Ian Kama, that's the way he would like to be referred to. He was one of the initial people to react and say, wait a minute, Africa is not that kind of stuff. The president of Senegal, Maxar, did the same thing. The entire diplomatic community at the United Nations from African countries unanimously came up with the, with the resolutions being very, very critical of the president of the United States and in fact demanded that uh, he actually withdraw and apologize. Some of the ambassadors said actually they had not even contacted their home mm. headquarters and what have you, so they didn't know what would be coming there. So 
I can find I can find my friend uh, Ambassador Adonia Ayebari in a situation that uh, is probably uh, not very politically tenable because you have his boss now saying, you know what, I am on the side of Trump. You look at the African Union. The African Union is supposed to be the headquarters or the de facto really headquarters of, of Africa. Yeah. It had a very strong statement saying, hey, get, come on, man, you can't talk like that. We don't think that we are exactly what you have described us to be. So I think in a very short, you know, really, when you talk about it, this man is obviously who somebody could characterize as a political opportunist because he simply needs to be on the right side of Trump because he thinks that if he's on the left side of Trump, he may end up actually um, losing some ground, some clout. Yeah. And I don't think he's in a, he is, uh, uh, I don't think that um, he is the kind of person who is in a hurry to do that. Yeah. Shaka, what are you talking about at Tomorrow in Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow it is very interesting because we are actually looking at uh, uh, one, the one-year anniversary of the Trump administration in Washington. Uh, uh, we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, let's go to another uh, comment here from Adesela uh, Henry. Why does Africa continually have, to, uh, have bad leadership and what can we do to get better leaders? First of all, I think uh, you are not talking about having leaders, really, because uh, if you had leaders, it would mean that uh, you are in control of them, and therefore, whatever they would do, whatever policies they would come up with are reflections of your concerns, of your hopes, uh, of your desires, uh, and frankly, of what you'd like to see happen. But in a situation where you have people who occupy positions and uh, making decisions without consulting you, consulting their people, uh, without even allowing a situation where people can participate. Uh, therefore, we have a situation where you are actually led by rulers, really, mm. just in the same way that uh, Africa had colonialism. This is pretty much the same thing, except that this time around, one could actually say it is a sort of internal colonialism. Why do I say internal colonialism? Because these are a group of elite uh, who look like you, who were probably born uh, with you in the same neighborhoods, and some of them probably mm -hmm. attend the same schools like you and what have you. But because they have power right now, they are basically, what I often say, patriotic to their stomachs, the stomachs of their relatives, families, and not patriotic to the neighborhoods, to the communities, or to what some call villages or a country for that matter. Uh, very briefly, uh, what do you s uh, very briefly, what do you say about uh, President uh, Paul Kagame uh, accepting uh, uh, refugees, uh, people who are being deported uh, from uh, Israel uh, to, uh, to Rwanda and Uganda? Well, first of all, you are saying accepting them because, let's face it, uh, both President Kagame and President Museveni's governments are actually denying that they ever cut a deal with Tel Aviv in order to have some of those refugees you mentioned, even though the United Nations is on the record saying they actually did. And they have even talked with some of the individuals that were involved in going to either Chigari or Kampala. Uh, well, on that note, uh, thank you so much, Ashaka. Uh, it's always a delight uh, having you. And I look forward to hosting you on another edition of Ashaka Extra Time. You're most welcome. Yeah. In the meantime, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, all our viewers. And we look forward to interacting with you next week on another edition of Ashaka Extra Time. Until then, uh, goodbye from uh, Washington.